Pacific Look TV. I have with me here our second speaker for this evening, Roger Martin. Apologies for I think four or five of you who've done this before, you know who you are. Um, I'm just going to use you for a little ex social experiment before we start it. Would you just humour me for a minute? Stick a hand up, please, and keep it up. If you have taken a taxi in this town, or an Uber, in the last six months, I know I have. Take a taxi, keep your hand up, please. And could you continue to keep your hand up if in that taxi you did not wear a seatbelt? Okay, so right there in the room is your staff's attitude to compliance. Okay, why don't you wear a seatbelt? Well, taxis don't have accents. Yes, they do. Uh, London traffic moves at 15 miles an hour, it'll be fine. If you try to smack your face into anything at 15 miles an hour, not a good idea. Uh, taxis are driven by kind of self-preservation, so they'll drive carefully across the way. You know. um, who are statistically the only people who wear seatbelts in taxis? Anybody? The parents of young, the parents of young children. When travelling with their children, I've actually had groups of lawyers and banks also say, the minute the kids get out of the car, I take the belt off. Now, even though, just to be absolutely clear, when you get into that taxi, right on your eye line, there is a note in front of you that says, wear your seatbelt, it's the law. So, people's attitude to compliance is very often conditioned by, nobody does it, I won't get hurt, I don't really understand the instruction, although there's a quite count of the seatbelt thing. You know. uh, the point is, the instruction is given in a, in a way that is kind of careless and doesn't land right with your need to get on with your life. And there are, I mean, we, if we had the slide version of this, I'd show you some fantastically stupid compliance instructions out there. Right, so let me, uh, I've just jotted down a few thoughts. Forgive me for not being as structured as the, the, the before and after, but let me try and capture a few things that are top of mind, given that I've been speaking all day already. So, um, the issue is, you know, are we in danger of forcing compliance on people when it comes to conduct? Or, to put it another way, are we guilty of saying to our frontline staff, many of whom are actually functional adults, you know, let's remember, our frontline staff, are we saying to them, as it were, sit down and shut up whilst I tell you how to behave? You know, let me tell you what good behaviour looks like. So think about that just as a social interaction for a minute. You've first of all claimed you have superior knowledge, which kind of may or may not be empirically true, and you also insulted your audience by implying that they don't know what good behaviour looks like. So it's right up there along with, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves um, as a control instruction. So let's not do that. Um, what we need to do is not tell people but ask them. You know, in my experience talking to banks over more than 20 years, the majority of people in financial services are not setting out to be evil. There are little pockets of corruption, overselling, rule bending, uh, you know, pulling stuff around and rearranging the furniture, if you like, but it's not fundamentally evil. You know, we are not a market of bad people, much though the ministers who you know, tell the regulator what to do would like to project that image. So, um, let's skip to SMCR because I've been asked to talk about that. Banks have had a two-year head start on SMCR uh, over the rest of the market, which is great. I interview uh, the boards of directors of banks, I interview the boards of directors of insurers and asset managers. Let me tell you what an insurer said to me last month. Uh, SMCR will be fine, it was the banker's problem. <laughs> now, my personal view is the insurance market is about to get run over by a trade marked SMCR. They have no idea what's going to hit them. So, apologies to insurers here who are not on board. Um, so the bankers have had two years to get familiar with it, which is great, and you know, familiarity breeds contempt. I say it takes familiarity to breed anything, so that's okay. Um, you know, we need to move on beyond that sense of it's all okay now, and think what next do we do with our conduct measures? How else do we engage staff? Can we stop kind of hitting people with it as a compliance requirement, and think a little bit harder about embedding? So when people come to my uh, workshops at UK Finance, there are two questions that I hear most often. The first one is, what does good behaviour look like? Uh, by which they don't actually mean, what does good behaviour look like? They mean, when I report what I'm doing, how can I make it look good so that the regulator will go away? Um, the second question, which is a sort of cousin to the first, is um, the MI we have, you know, the reporting that we have, 
is not the MI that we need, but we don't know what it should be. You know, can you help? Where do we look for metrics <coughs> for behavior? And it's really hard because you can't just freeze metrics. You know, what is good behavior? Again, we could do a little test in the room. Good behavior is a moving object. It moves as you change, you know, as you grow up, as you change jobs. It's very socially driven. We're checking with our neighbors all the time. Is my behavior okay? Little test in the room you can try with your team. Hands up anybody whose idea of a good night out now is the same as it was when you were 17 years old. Uh, any takers? Yeah, just leave. Last year, yes. My point is, what is, and just to be clear, the regulator uses as one of their smell tests, is this acceptable and expected behavior? So who is to say what is acceptable and expected? Answer, the clients, the customers, the markets, the counterparties, the regulator, your own junior staff. Your staff are one of your best resources for what does good look like. You know, stop telling them how to behave and maybe ask them intuitively, are they okay with something or not okay with something? What we're trying to do is promote conversations. And I know we had an energetic conversation about whistleblowing here. I don't want to rubbish whistleblowing. It's a great initiative and we should promote it. But actually, why don't we think also of migrating people away from the sort of whistleblowing, conflicted way of doing this <coughs> stuff towards what I call socializing risk? You know, get a conversation around the table. Legitimize that it's okay to put a hand up. Now, the problem is, it's not as simple as just saying to people, come on, put a hand up, you know, tell us if there's something wrong, because people don't engage. Just like you with your seatbelt in the taxi, people don't kind of buy into that. Um, an example is, uh, John knows who this is because I've just said that I'm working with the brand. There is a certain uh, challenger bank where the chief exec flies in from California or wherever once a month, sits in the middle of the enormous floor, and you know, 200 staff gather around in a reverential circle. And that is known as a town hall meeting. And most particularly, none of the frontline staff who are actually looking at what was going on. So I said, can I, I said to my friend, the CRO, do you mind if I just borrow a few of the people from this meeting and interview them, because that's what I do. Um, and uh, sure, fine, so I did. And they said, you know, so in answer to the question, why didn't you put a hand up in a meeting where you're supposed to put a hand up? They said, well, I didn't want to look stupid. I thought the other guy was going to. Um, it's not a question anyone would want to answer, or worst, uh, oh, my mate put a hand up last month, <laughs> got his question answered, and then nothing else happened. You know, there was no follow through. So actually putting a hand up wasn't really putting a hand up at all. It was just going through the motions, or uh, what my friends at the LSE call a ritual audit. You know, just kind of making marks on a bit of paper. So um, to kind of round out, because I could round up all night about this, let's just pick up on a few kind of conduct indicators that take us beyond where we are. I'm very often presented with, you know, smugly by somebody with a, look at this great scorecard we've created, all this stuff on it, which is measuring how it, the thing I most often see at the top of the scorecard is training attendance. And let's just be absolutely clear, this is how many bums were on seats on a certain day last year. Now, I don't know about you, I think the, the presence of a bottom on a chair is not actually a valid read of behavior change, or maybe I'm missing something, right? The fact that somebody went into a room on a day and listened to another person or sat in front of the screen and did a thing, surely that's an input measure. That's like we hear from ministers all the time. Somebody says, so minister, what's the thing you're doing? And the minister says, oh, well, look at all this money that I've thrown at the problem. Or look how many bodies I've staffed this agency with that's intervening to fix the, you know, whatever. You very rarely get an answer that says, as a result of this inter inter what's the word? intervention, uh, these are the things that change. You know, people modify their behavior following this.